We recently finished a web video series called Ski Pure Michigan. Each video in the series was filmed with professional gear, with multiple camera angles, carefully edited to a voiceover to create videos at a high production value. But they were done in record time. Each video was filmed by just two people at about two hours per location, and each episode was edited in less than one workday. That's really fast. And in this video, I'll show you how we pulled it off. Hey guys, Drew here. Welcome to my living room editing workspace. Fun fact, did you know that Michigan has more ski resorts than any other state in the country? Except New York. There are lots of cool ski resorts all around Michigan. The video series we made took up a really big part of my work life. So I wanted to walk you through our filming approach, talk about the gear we used, and later dive into the editing process as well. This is really an all encompassing start to finish breakdown of the entire production process. Before diving into the details of production, I wanna talk a little bit about video production efficiency because that's really the meat and potatoes of this video. I often say that every video you make is kinda of like a statement showing what you are capable of doing as a filmmaker. And so with that in mind, it makes sense that you would want to make every single video the absolute best that you can. But that's not always feasible, it's not always practical because we're often given lots of limitations. Uh, sometimes it's uh, money and budget. For us, it was time. Time was our big limitation. We had a lot of videos to produce and we only had a short amount of time to do it. High production value is great, but there's a different and very real value that we can have as filmmakers being able to produce high quality video content quickly. So for this project, I had to find the sweet spot on the spectrum of production speed and production quality. As much as we like to talk about camera gear, the real thing that kept us efficient as possible wasn't the gear. It was having a strong video structure so that we could go into each shoot with a clear vision of the footage we needed to capture. So, video structure, let's dive into it. We started with the idea that we wanted to make videos to inspire travel to ski resorts in Michigan. Rather than making one video, we broke it up into several short videos, each one focusing on a different ski area. We also took it a step further and made each video focus on a specific signature ski run at each place. We wanted to keep the videos short and sweet so that watching each one only required a small time commitment from the viewer, and narrowing our focus to just one run seemed like a good way to do that. Our studies show that short videos get shared more, and we wanted to make highly shareable content. Each video features our pro skier and our guide, Odie, and he narrates the videos telling the experience from his perspective. So that's the big picture. Diving a little deeper, each video starts with an overview of the entire resort or ski area, usually mentioning the skiable acres, the number of lifts, maybe a fun fact about the resort's history. Then we begin to focus on the signature run, following it from top to bottom as Odie narrates his experience, pointing out features along the way. We wrap things up with something a skier or snowboarder might enjoy at the end of the day on the slopes, like enjoying a beer at the lodge or warming up by the fire or other opera ski amenities that are available in that area. Even though the different resorts that we were featuring were different sizes and had lots of different features, this structure we thought would be repeatable, so we'd have consistent episodes from one to the next. I'm not necessarily explaining all of this so that you really understand these videos. I'm explaining this so that you see uh, the extent to which we plan things ahead of time. I feel like a lot of people just like say, oh, we're gonna make a video about skiing. Let's hit the slopes and bring on the cameras and just capture stuff. But the point was to really plan things in advance so that we were as efficient as possible when we were out there. After all of that, finally, it's time to pack the cameras, hit the road and start capturing footage. After digging around the internet looking for video inspiration, I landed on four main shots that would make up the footage we needed. The first one was the aerial footage, both of the ski hill and of Odie going down the signature run. Next, we did follow shots or tracking shots. I don't know, people have all different names for them, but following Odie using a gimbal on skis going down the run with him. Uh, I saw a lot of similar shots that follow people from behind, but I wanted to see Odie's face, so I chose to ski a little bit ahead of him and pointed the camera backwards. Next, we did flyby or ski by shots with a stationary camera where Odie skis by. Usually these were done in slow motion. Things in slow motion look better when there are uh, airborne particles or things flying through the air. Sometimes if you're driving a car and you do it in slow motion, it just looks like the car is going slowly. 
Uh, so we wanted to make sure if we're showing footage of Odie in slow motion, he needs to be kicking up snow or something like that. So these ski by shots were a good way for him to kick up snow at the camera as he went by. And lastly, from the base of the hill, I wanted to get a telephoto shot looking up, uh, usually around 300 millimeters, following Odie as he came down. And the telephoto shots at the end uh, were good at showing speed. If the run was known for being a really fast one, then we'd use more of these shots. Add some additional footage of the resort and the signage and some other people enjoying their day on the slopes and you have a nice collection of footage for that episode. So we had our four-ish shots down and the next step was figuring out how to get it all captured super fast. After a few runs, we found our stride. Each time Odie went down the run, the two of us would each get one of the shots described earlier. Then, the time it took for Odie to go back up the lift, we would reposition and prepare for the next run. And if we had some free time in between, we'd capture some location B-roll from wherever we were positioned at that time. For example, while Kyle, who was filming most of these videos with me, was getting the drone shots, I could be at the bottom of the hill shooting telephoto to get Odie going down the hill. The drone wouldn't be in my shot, and I'm far enough down the hill that I'm not in his shot. But we couldn't do the drone shot with the follow shot. We couldn't usually do the drone shot with the ski by shots because you'd notice a person on the side of the hill. Sometimes we'd both do ski by shots, positioning ourselves at like two different places along the side of the hill. But by the end of the season this year, Kyle and I were able to get all of the footage we needed for each episode with Odie only going down six times. Not too bad, huh? So let's talk cameras. We used a Sony FS5 for the slow-mo stuff, a Sony A9 for video and for photos, Sony A6500, and occasionally a Sony A7 III. We used a DJI Inspire 1 Pro for most of the drone stuff in the beginning, but recently upgraded to a DJI Mavic 2 Pro. A lot easier to carry up and down the hill. For the follow shots, I used either the 6500 or the A9, mounted on a DJI Ronin S, and for one or two of the resorts, I used a Zion Crane. For the lenses, we have the Sony Zoom Lens Trio, 16-35 f4, and also the 24-70 and 70-200 2.8. I also have a 70 to 300 lens, and for the crop sensor cameras, we have the 10 to 18 and the 18 to 105 f4 lenses. And then for some of the resorts that we were filming at night, under the lights, we would sometimes break out the Rokinon Primes. So we have the 35, 24, and 85. This sounds like a lot of gear, but we were actually able to stay pretty nimble with this. With the exception of the Inspire, we were able to carry all of the stuff in two Atlas packs, which were a huge help for getting our gear up and down the hill and repositioning throughout the ski areas. So despite the fine-tuned tactical approach we had for filming, we did run into some snags here and there. Sometimes people saw the cameras and just really wanted to talk to us and wondered what we were doing. We also had some weather issues. We had lots of snow. It was really good powder. It was awesome. but. I would go through several microfiber cloths trying to keep the lenses cleared of snow and water. And in some videos, there's just some snow on the lens and did what I could, but yeah, it was really hard to keep them clean with all the snow we had. But for the most part, we were able to capture everything we needed within a two hour filming window. Time to transfer that footage, get it in Adobe Premiere and start editing. While the footage was transferring, I worked with the rest of my team to get the voiceover script written, and then I would work with Odie to record it. In editing, I would always start with the audio. Laying out the audio, not only set up the structure for the video, but once I put a music track in, I could work with the pace, leaving spaces here and there to let the voiceover breathe a little bit, and let the music step into the spotlight for those big moments. Once the audio is set up, I would go through the footage and reduce each clip to the usable material, and then line them up on the timeline based on the four different shots that they were, whether they're slow-mo or real speed, that sort of thing. Once that was set up, drag and drop, plug in the clips to match the voiceover. And at this point, the structure of the video is pretty much already set in place. Since the audio already tells the story, this should be a pretty quick process. So what clips am I putting in different places? I'm not the kind of person that thinks you need to have every clip line up to exactly what a voiceover is saying, but it does make sense that if you're talking about the number of runs at a resort, you might show a map. If you're talking about the number of lifts, might as well show a lift. As a general rule of thumb, drone shots are a great way to kick off the video because it helps establish the location. One thing I made sure to do was show someone skiing almost right away. That way if someone were to stumble onto this video out on the internet, out of context, they would know right away that it's a video about skiing. 
I also wanted to avoid editing two shots in a row that would look like a jump cut. So like, I didn't want to show two drone shots in a row, or two follow shots in a row, unless they were significantly different, or I would like punch in because we were shooting in 4K. I tried to mix it up by showing like a drone shot, or a follow shot, or a telephoto shot, then another drone shot, mixing in location footage, so it all felt natural without any awkward transitions or jump cuts. So even though we had a plan going in, sometimes we did weave our experience into the story as well. Like this particular resort you're seeing here, when we were there it was really busy and it looked great. Like it was a really lively place. So we made that part of the story and included it in the voiceover. We also planned with each resort in advance to include anything specific that they were especially proud of or worked really hard to do and uh, we included that in the voiceover as well. In editing, one of my favorite things to do is save one or two of the coolest video shots and pair them with the big moments in the video. What do I mean by that? When the voiceover reaches the end of a statement or a phrase and the music kicks in to be what is like the chorus or the main melody, it creates kind of a big moment. I like to pair those with big visual moments as well. It's not always something that you notice, but if it's done right, it makes the video flow a lot better. Okay, so at this point, I would do a really quick color correcting color grading pass, starting with an adjustment layer over all of the clips. I would then add a preset to that adjustment layer, tweaking it to how I liked it, and then I'd go through each clip and adjust the exposure, usually the whites and the highlights as well as the shadows. The A9, for example, is really contrasty, so it was normal practice to boost the shadows and bring down the highs so it matched the footage from the other cameras. With this whole editing thing, I'm really breezing through it here. Honestly, I think this could be a video on its own. If there's something here that you'd like me to dive into more detail with, uh, let me know. I'm more than happy to talk about my editing approach and why I'm choosing to put clips in different places. But once the edit was done, I did a quick review with the rest of the team. Then the videos were exported, uploaded, distributed, and I was on to the next video. Whew! On to the next one. So I'm not saying that this is by any means the best way to do video production. There is value in taking your time to do things. A lot of the time you have a creative epiphany just by messing around or experimenting. And this kind of shooting did not allow for any of that really. It was just what can we do as fast as possible to get this done. And so uh, there was very little experimentation. We just followed basically the plan that we set up in the beginning. And so if I were to do this again, uh, I would love to do to have some more time. This isn't really a sustainable pace for all video productions because this was uh, repeatable content that was kind of in an episodic format. It was easier for me to put this together really, really quickly. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out. I'd love to talk to you more about any parts of the process. And let me know if you'd like to see more videos like this. Uh, this is kind of a new thing for me, but I thought it was a a fun video topic to talk about, and I'd love to keep the conversation going.